Um, I've been my, I'm basically a scholar of the Old Testament. I've been studying the Old Testament for years since I was an undergraduate student. I've been involved in campus ministry, teaching the Bible to university students in Canada and the U.S. My, I'm originally from Kingston, Jamaica, and I immigrated to Canada when I was in my 20s, and I immigrated to the U.S. Um, in 20, about 20 years ago to get a job here. I want to start by quoting a very important book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> Space is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. So just how big is space? So let's start with our solar system. You probably heard that the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. I can't figure out exactly how big that is. That's pretty large, right? That's far away. Now, since Pluto was demoted from being a planet, the furthest planet in our solar system is Neptune. Do you know how far away Neptune is from the sun? It's just under 3,000 million miles. That's mind-bogglingly big, I think, and that's just our solar system. And of course, we're just part of the Milky Way galaxy. Estimates for the size of the Milky Way galaxy run from 100 billion stars to 400 billion stars, depending how many stars you think the galaxy holds. Okay? Either way, there's a lot of stars, and there's a lot of space between the stars. But the Milky Way is just one galaxy in the universe. A universe that has, on a, a minimal estimate, 20 billion trillion stars. I can't conceive that number. The furthest star is 47 billion light years away. It took 47 billion years for light to travel to reach us from the edge of the galaxy. That means the universe is 94 billion light years across. That's mind-bogglingly big. Um, that might be an understatement, actually. The universe is not only very big, it's very old. As far as we can figure out, the Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. The universe began with the Big Bang, perhaps 13.8 billion years ago. So that's, we're infinitesimal when it comes to numbers like that. So the universe is really, really big and very, very old. And most people who read Genesis 1 have thought that the modern scientific picture of the universe of such an immense size and age is in tension with the Bible's picture of what the universe was when God made it, especially found in Genesis 1. After all, according to Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth, that is the universe, in six days and rested on the seventh. And by some calculations, if you use the genealogies in Genesis, this took place no more than 6,000, maybe 10,000 years ago. But going beyond the assumed contradiction of time scale, there's the widely different understandings of the size of the universe. I don't think the ancients who wrote Genesis 1 had any idea of the size of the universe that we have. So that's just the first point on my handout. But now we come to Genesis 1, which is a very important text. It is the opening passage in the canon of scripture. It is the opening portrayal of God and the world and human beings in a narrative, a large story that stretches through the pages of the Bible. Of course, not everything in the Bible is in story form, but this is the beginning of an unfolding story. So it's really important what gets said at the beginning. As you probably have heard, you know, the first words somebody says are probably the most important because you remember them. So you're going to remember mind-bogglingly big from me, right? <laughs> the problem is that we live in a contested cultural context where we read Genesis 1 very differently. So one problem with the way people address Genesis 1 is they think, okay, we have this scientific picture which we know is true. Genesis 1 doesn't really match that. So Genesis 1 must be false. So let's just dismiss the Bible. That's a skeptical approach. The flip side of that approach is found among many Christians who think, well, Genesis 1 has to match what science says. So if it doesn't, the science must be wrong. So we reject science. Those are called young earth creationists. So you get both skeptics and some Christians who have the same idea that we must fit the Bible to science. And if we don't, 
we reject one of them. Now there's another approach, and that's my third bullet point on the point three, which is a little better, and I have met some of the people in this approach, and they're, they're from an organization called Reasons to Believe, and they believe in the, the large universe and the ancient universe, so what they try and show is the Bible actually teaches that. So we had the director of Reasons to Believe, Hugh Ross, come to speak at, in chapel at Roberts Wesleyan College, where I teach. And my students, who had just taken an introduction to the Old Testament course with me, were cringing in their seats, saying, how can he claim the Bible is saying the universe is infinite in size and <coughs> ancient? The Bible doesn't say that. And every text he chose to illustrate this was a misreading. You cannot harmonize the Bible and science. Let's just say that at the beginning. You can't do that. The problem is that we have tried to fit the, the portrayal of creation in Genesis 1 into a modern scientific mold. It was never meant to address contemporary people in the world today. It was written to ancient people. So unless we can understand how an ancient person would have understood Genesis 1, we'll misinterpret what it's saying. We need not to read the text for what we think it ought to say, using our modern assumptions as the norm, but what would an ancient person have understood it to mean? So we need to relativize, for the time being, our assumptions about the cosmos and the universe. Not that they're wrong, but don't use them to read the text. The text is not addressing those questions. So you have a diagram on the bottom of page one of your chart. It's got some colors in it. I put a few colored diagrams here to kind of wake you up if I'm getting boring, right? I want to talk about the literary framework or the pattern of Genesis 1. <laughs> And you can keep looking at the diagram. I'm going to go to stuff on page two, but I think if you're a visual person, look at the diagram. I'm going to try and explain the diagram to you. God creates over six days and rests on the seventh. The first three days, we call that panel one, have a certain pattern to them. And the second three days, We'll call that panel two, have a different pattern. On the first three days, God separates realms. On the second three days, God fills the realms with inhabitants, creatures that inhabit them. On the first three realms, the re first three days, the, the realms are static. On the second three days, the creatures are mobile. They may not be all living creatures, but they move. So what God does on day one matches what happens on day four. On day one, well, let's, let's, start, let's start with the, very, the second verse of Genesis 1. And the earth was covered in water, and darkness was over the face of the deep. So if you are an earth dweller, you couldn't live on the earth because it's covered in water. And if you are an air breather, there's nothing to breathe because it's only water. And if you need light <coughs> photosynthesis, you can't function because it's dark. So what does God do on day one? God separates light from dark. Don't think modern. Don't think God is separating photons from dark matter. Okay? God is, it says God named the light day and the night he named light. God is instituting two realms of time that alternate day and night. God is setting up time. And since you have a part of the day where it's bright and a part of the night where it's dark, what are the inhabitants on day four that fit? The sun for the, for the day, the moon and the stars for the night. They're called the great lights and the little lights. You may say, the moon doesn't actually give light. It reflects light. Don't bring science into it. It's giving a phenomenological description of the way the world works. It's not about science. Day two. Okay, we got time. We got alternation of day and light. But the world is covered in water. Then God separates the waters above and below by a dome. So imagine that... Everything is covered in water, and suddenly an air bubble starts and builds up to a huge dome that keeps water at bay. You know those little um, things where you have snow inside and you shake them at Christmas? That's what the world was viewed to be, and the heavens was a dome that held back the waters above. Fine, it's not our cosmology, it's ancient cosmology, but what that allows is now creatures that are going to breathe air can now exist. So, on the day that matches that, day five, what does God do? He fills the air with flying creatures and fills the water with swimming creatures, fish and birds. Makes sense? It's not about science. It's about a, a system to make the world work. 
on day three, okay, we've got air breathing stuff, but the whole earth is covered in water. So what God does on day three is he separates water, that dry land emerges. <coughs> and the, the, the waters become the oceans, the dry land is the earth. And what does he do on day six? He makes land animals to live on the land and humans, a particular form of land animal. And then he does one more thing on day three and six that's interesting. He says, let the land bring forth vegetation and things start growing on the land. On day six, he gives the vegetation to the animals, the birds, and the people to eat as food. So what you have here is what I call an architectonic scheme. You know, an architect designs things to make it work. Here is a designed world that functions. It's not a scientific description, but it's a world that is made with wisdom that creatures can inhabit it. So I've got a list on the point two on page two of bullet points. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to tell you that in Psalm 104, the psalmist looks out at the world and says, what an amazing world God made. It's full of his creatures. The world is full of wisdom. And in Psalm 139, the psalmist says, and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Both subjectively looking at my own self and objectively looking at the world. I see a world that is designed, that is amazing to look at, and many scientists who study the world in technical detail say the world is amazingly designed. They may not say there was a designer, but they think it's a, it's a magnificent creation that we live in. Proverbs 8 has wisdom speaking, personified. Wisdom says, before God made the world, I was there. I was sort of the plan God had. Then God used me in building the world. So when, I, when the world was made, I was there the whole time he was making it. Because God made the world according to wisdom. And then in the fourth bullet point, Job 28, we have this question. Where can wisdom be found? It's really hard to find wisdom in this world. So many disagreements about so much. So the poem in Job 28 asks, if you go to the heavens and you ask the birds in the sky, where is wisdom? They'll say, not here. We'd have, we've, we've flown far and wide. We can't find it. You go to the depths of the ocean. You ask the creatures down there, where is wisdom? They say, we don't have it. It's not here either. And the, the, the poet says, when God created the world, he looked at wisdom, he appraised it, he tested it, and he embedded it in the cosmos. And the wisdom literature of the Old Testament suggests that if you observe the way the world works, you will become wise, because you will discern the wisdom of God embedded in the created order. The cosmos, then, is built according to God's wisdom in the Bible. But I use built advisedly because we have this interesting metaphor. Let me read to you now a few biblical texts. These are two texts from Proverbs. The first one is from Proverbs 24. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So you want to construct a, a, a good house? You've got to use some discernment and wisdom so it doesn't collapse on you, right? You've got to build it well. You build the structure and then you fill it with all kinds of stuff, furniture and so on, and plumbing and all this kind of stuff, things to make it work. Now in Proverbs chapter three, we have almost an identical statement about the cosmos. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding established the heavens, by his knowledge the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. God constructed a house called the universe, the world, and this is a house that you dwell in. It's got a structure that makes sense, and it's got inhabitants, and because he made it rain and moisture, things can grow. Because without rain, without water, nothing can live. Verbs like founded, established, are architectural terms. Even in the New Testament, if you've ever read the King James Version, you will hear this phrase, from the foundations of the earth. Modern translation just say from the creation of the world. But foundations is an architectural metaphor. And in the ancient world, they thought of the world as a building. And that's why on the next bullet point, Job chapter 38, God questions Job. Job has been questioning God. Why are you letting me suffer this way? I want an answer. I want an explanation for my suffering. And God says to Job, were you there when I constructed the world? When I established it? When I founded it? When I built its bases? When I built its cornerstone? That's all architectural terminology. The ancients consistently, both in the Bible and in the cultures around, thought of the world as a building that we inhabit with other creatures. 
In Genesis 1 verse 2, before God had structured the world, we're told that the world was formless and empty. King James, formless and void. The Hebrew is <coughs> an interesting onomatopoeic term, tohu vavohu. It kind of means like halter skelter, hurly burly. The world is kind of chaotic. Nothing was really organized yet. But the terms tohu and vohu can mean formless and empty. So at the beginning, the world was formless, then God gave it form. It was empty, God filled it with inhabitants. And at the end, we're told, thus, the heavens and the earth, that's the form, was finished, and all its array, or multitude, or host, all the things that lived in it. That's a coherent narrative of creation. In Isaiah 45, we have this statement. It's kind of a subsidiary statement. It's not the main point. It's like that God is giving a, a, an oracle of hope to people who are despairing and he says thus says the Lord who, just a definition of who God is who didn't create the world to be tohu or chaotic but created it to be inhabited it's kind of part of the biblical picture the world is meant to be a building inhabited by us so there is a picture that I put at the end of that which standard drawing people have interpreted the world as imagine that is the cosmos there's water all around but there's airspace and there's the deep, the oceans that go down deep. And you see the little teeny guy in the middle there? That's a human being. We're small. Now, they don't think the world is quite as big as we think it is. But still, we're relatively insignificant in the world. The world is a cosmic building. But the world is built in six days and God rests on the seventh. What's all that about? Doesn't that mean God made the world in literally six days? not a, a long history of evolution and creation. Well, we have this six plus one framework in Genesis one. We also have seven times it says, and it was so. God said, let this happen, and it was so. Seven times it says it was so. Seven times God said it was good. God looked and saw that it was good. The last time God saw it was very good. Seven times. Why, what are the sevens all about? You've probably heard, right? Seven is the number of perfection or completion. You've heard that? I heard that all my life. There's no basis for that whatsoever. That's pure <laughs> legend. There is actually a different reason for seven that's much more <coughs> grounded. Now, we'll come to that. The word God in Hebrew occurs 35 times in the creation story. That's a multiple of seven. The word earth occurs 21 times. That's a multiple of seven. The number of words in the first two verses before God starts to create is 21. That's a multiple of seven. Verse one, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, seven words in Hebrew. And the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. 14 words in Hebrew. Who is taking all this time to make sevens everywhere? Somebody went to a lot of trouble. Okay, and I didn't calculate all of these, I calculated those myself, but many other people. How many words in Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3 about the seventh day? 35 words in Hebrew, that's a multiple of seven. How many words in the, the creation story of Genesis 1? 469, that's a multiple of seven. Somebody went to a lot of trouble here to make a point. What's the point? Let's shift from Genesis 1 for a moment to the story of the building of the tabernacle, the mobile tent for God's dwelling with the people of Israel in their wilderness journey. There are, in the book of Exodus, there are seven speeches God gives Moses about building the tabernacle. There are 14 summaries, that's a multiple of seven, of Moses doing as God asked, parallel to as it was so in Genesis 1. And I go on, it's touching the surface right here. Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem in seven years. The temple was dedicated in a seven-day feast of tabernacles in the seventh month of the Israelite year. Solomon's temple dedication speech is structured around seven specific petitions or requests he makes of God. We have evidence from the, the ancient world of a Gudea, an ancient Sumerian king of Lagash in the 22nd century BC, who had a seven-day dedication feast for his temple when it was dedicated. The building of the temple of the Canaanite god Baal, Baal, in the Canaanite myth, took seven days. What's going on here? Seven is not the number of completion or perfection. Seven is associated with worship. It is a liturgical number. 
associated with temples and priesthood in the ancient world, both in Israel and outside of Israel. So remember the, the conquest of Jericho, Joshua faced the battle of Jericho, that old spiritual? Well, we have seven priests march around the city for seven days, seven times on the seventh day blowing their trumpets called the shofar in front of the Ark of the Covenant to prove that the city was conquered by an act of worship, not by military might. That's what sevens are all about. So the six plus one time frame in Genesis 1 has nothing to do with scientific calculations of how long it took God to make the earth. It's about the dedication of the cosmic temple, a seven-day dedication ceremony, after which the temple is complete and God rests. We'll get to the rest in just a moment. So in the Bible, the, the creation is not just a building, it is a particular kind of building. It is a temple. And in fact, the Bible also shares that with the ancient Near East. Many people thought of the cosmos as a temple in which the gods dwell in the Holy of Holies. That's called heaven. That's a symbol for transcendence. Can you get to heaven? We can put spaceships up there, but how many thousands of people down below have to support one spaceship? Because it's not a natural realm. So in Isaiah chapter 66, God says, Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. What is this little puny house, this temple you're, you're building for me? I don't need that. I already built my own temple. It's the cosmos. This is a critique of people rebuilding the Jerusalem temple after it was destroyed. I, I made the cosmic temple. So everything is already sacred space. Why are you building a little temple in Jerusalem? You think I need that? Psalm 115 says, The heavens are the Lord's heavens, Yahweh's heavens. But the earth is given to human beings. Okay. So the earth is not a secular place, it is the holy place, but the holy of holies is heaven. Now in the temple, in the tabernacle, the holy of holies is kind of where God's presence is concentrated and the priests can't enter there. But the presence of God in the holy of holies permeates out and makes the whole place holy. So here's a picture um, from the 6th century AD by a monk who they've named Cosmas Indopoplustus. It's, it's the name because Cosmas has to do with the word cosmos, and he, he drew a picture of the cosmos, and he made it look like the tabernacle. And the Holy of Holies was a mountain, that's Mount Zion, the center of the earth, the navel of the earth, where God's presence is. Now, in the Middle Ages, by the time you got to about the third or fourth century AD, all people in the Middle Ages believed, as far as we know, that the earth was a sphere. That comes from the Greek philosophers, the pre-Socratics and Plato and Aristotle. It permeated Christian thought by about the third or fourth century. According to some skeptics, Christians believed that the world was flat in the Middle Ages. No evidence for that. There's only two people you can point to who believe the earth was flat in the Middle Ages. One is this guy. And that's only if you take him literally. But this is a metaphor. He's saying the earth is a holy cosmic place where God dwells. And Jerusalem is the center of that. So how does God's presence get from heaven, which is distant from us, to earth? Well, in Exodus 31, as God is about to, to give instructions for building this tabernacle, this tent of God's dwelling among the Israelites in the wilderness, he appoints one guy named Bezalel to be the overseer of the construction. This is a wise guy who had a lot of skills in constructing. And he said, Bezalel was filled with the spirit of God, also with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. God used it to build the world, a house is built by that, and the tabernacle is a miniature cosmos, a little temple. When the tabernacle is completed, the spirit of God that was in Bethlehem filled the tabernacle. A cloud came down of God's glory and permeated it. God indwelled his house, his, temp his tabernacle. Later Jewish tradition calls it Shekinah, glory of God. It's not a term from the Bible, but it's from later Jewish tradition. When the Jerusalem temple was complete, we also find a reference to the, the glory of God coming and filling it, God's spirit permeating the temple. Now, at the beginning of creation, God's spirit was hovering over the waters as if God was getting ready to breathe his presence into the cosmos. But when the world is made in Genesis 2 and it's finished, there's no reference to God's filling the world with his presence. The world is somehow still empty, of, at least the, the earthly world is still empty of God's presence. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God breathes into a human being made from the dust of the ground. 
and the human being becomes alive. There you get the presence. So where, how is God's presence to be entered into the earthly temple? Through y'all, human beings who have the Spirit of God, the breath of God in you. It turns out that we have a whole bunch of texts from ancient Mesopotamia about how you consecrated an idol to put in a temple. Because an idol is something that's built. You, you build it out of wood, you overlay it with, with precious metals, gold and silver, and if you're one of the builders, you know that it's not a god, it's just a piece of wood that somebody's built. So you go through a ritual process by a gar in a garden, beside a river, Garden of Eden, okay? And it's consecrated. And when it's consecrated, the breath of the God enters it and it becomes alive and it becomes an image of a God. Then it's put in the temple. That's what they actually did. These liturgies over a series of seven days to make that happen. Genesis 2 is saying, no, the true image of God in the cosmic temple is human beings. We are meant to represent God who dwells in heaven from the Holy of Holies to make his presence known in the world. So each human being is a sacred person, is a priest of God. Humans are made to be the image in the cosmic temple. That is stated explicitly in Genesis 1. God, let us make humanity in our image and our likeness and let them rule. Because God who rules the universe from heaven is going to rule through human beings. And if you rule well, if you use your power and your agency well to enhance the blessing of this world, you manifest God's presence. And if you use your power and your agency to do violence and to bring destruction in this world, then you block the presence of God. So the coming of God's presence into the world depends on human beings who are not a mirror reflecting God back to himself. That would make God the great Narcissus in the sky who says, damn, I look good in that, those people. Man, let me see my hair is right. You know? No, God wants to pay it forward. So we are the prism of God taking the light of God and refracting it into the world. That's what it means to be human. Then you come to the seventh day and God rests. He's so tired out. It was a bad job. Man, I got to take a break now. No, that's not what it's about at all. We know that in the ancient Near East, in these stories of the cos cosmogony, the creation of the world, after the deity has created the world, he rests in his temple and the word rest means sit on his throne. Rest has to do with being enthroned, <coughs> present in the world, having created it. God is now sitting on his throne in heaven. That's the way the Bible consistently talks about it. God's in heaven, you better watch your words because he's watching y'all. Now, at the end of each day of creation, there is this very interesting um, refrain and there was evening and morning a first day and there was evening and morning a second day and there was evening and morning a third day and there was evening and morning a fourth day there was evening and morning a fifth day by the way it says and there was evening and morning to the sixth day something important on the sixth day there is no formula like that at the end of the seventh day because the seventh day in the bible has no end the seventh day is a day when god having taken up rule in the cosmic temple enthroned in heaven now has delegated authority to human beings to represent him on earth. And the seventh day is a day of human history. When we engage the world to bring out its potential. Imagine what the world was like before humans developed the kind of culture we have. Pretty barren. I love a lot of the stuff we have developed. We've developed some bad stuff. I understand it, right? Nuclear weapons and all kinds of things like that. But we've also developed institutions that bring justice. We've developed amazing works of art. We've developed good beer. Time to have a sip. Cheers. Cheers. L'chaim. To life. So we have the seventh day in which we are currently living. The question for us is, how do we connect this ancient understanding of the world as a cosmic temple to what we think of as a universe today? How do we blend conceptually this ancient world picture and the picture we have of the world today. And I find it helpful to distinguish between the terms world picture and world view. World picture comes from the German term Weltbild, the picture of the world you have, the image you have. 
And that refers to the cosmology or the cosmic geography, the way you understand the physical makeup of the world. Our cosmology, our, cosmo our cosmic geography is different from the ancients. But worldview is a way to speak about the distinctive and abiding values, the vision of life that makes sense of life, that is communicated through this ancient world picture. So here is the question. How can we transfer those abiding theological values from the ancient world picture to the present? Well, people have been doing that for a long time. Christians in earlier ages transferred the abiding values of the biblical picture of the world from a flat earth to the notion of the earth as a sphere. So the whole Middle Ages, the earth was a sphere. When it became clear that the earth revolved around the sun and not the sun around the earth, they had to adapt further. And you find some of the early Christians in the time of the Reformation doubting, but do, should we really believe that the earth revolves around the sun? Because it's pretty clear the sun is moving around the earth, right? And the Bible seems to assume that. But they, they managed to adapt the abiding theological vision of the Bible to a contemporary world picture. Can we go further now and adapt the world view of the Bible to our world picture? We've come to understand that our sun is just one among many stars in an expanding universe of billions of galaxies that have developed over deep time. Can we see this universe with the eyes of faith as God's good creation, the cosmic temple that God wants to inhabit with us and with other creatures? When the biblical writers spoke of God reigning from heaven, many Psalms speak of this, that was intended as a symbol of God's transcendence, because you can't get to heaven, it's really far away, it's a universe out there. It implies God is far above and beyond us, God's not reducible to us. But, since heaven and earth is how the Bible speaks about the universe, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, heaven is not some divine realm, it's part of the universe. And God has chosen to dwell in heaven. That's a metaphor, I understand it. It's a metaphor. But what it means is God has not just transcendent, God is also imminent. God has chosen to dwell within the cosmic creation. God has condescended to inhabit part of the created order. When the temple was being dedicated, Solomon pondered God's further condescension to inhabit the temple in the Holy of Holies. And he asked in amazement, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Indeed, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I've built. We who have a much clearer understanding of just how immense the heavens are can appreciate Solomon's <coughs> words in a new way. Even in a universe 94 billion light years across, that cannot fully contain God. God is bigger than that. The earth does not currently experience the fullness of God's presence due to human sin, corruption, and violence. But the Bible promises that even this small portion of the universe will one day be infused with God's presence. When the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. When the evil will be vanquished and the kingdom of God will come as it in on earth as it is in heaven. And in the words of the Apostle Paul, God will then be all in all which is not pantheism to say the world gets sucked up into God it's saying God permeates the universe so God is not absent from any part of our life experience 34 minutes I think I did that pretty good <laughs> <laughs> now we get time Does your round of applause